For 2022, the Subaru Forester receives a refresh and a new, more off-road capable trim, the Forester Wilderness. This is purporting to be one of the most rugged Subarus that they've ever built right from the factory. Today, I'm all dolled up in PPE because we need to go clear a trail, the sort of thing that you would do if you live out here in the forest and you had a vehicle that was theoretically designed for my demographic, like this Forester Wilderness. And Brian over here is an adventurous city dweller, so this is theoretically exactly the right kind of vehicle for him, for overlanding, for camping, for bike riding, that sort of thing. So what do you think? Well, I think wilderness additions are what Subaru was always meant to be at its core. You know, rugged looks, bulbous tires for off-roading, and features that help you mm -hmm. go further up that mountain pass or on that snowy trail. So I think this is going to be exciting to take a look at. But still definitely targeted at folks that work in the city like I do. I may live out here, but I don't work in a redwood tree. I work in an office. So this is the kind of vehicle that can accommodate your chainsaws in the back. Fun fact, in the winter, I actually travel with at least one chainsaw in the trunk of every car that I have because sometimes you need it, but it also gets decent fuel economy and is easy to park in the city. The refresh the Forester receives this year brings about a larger grill up front, but the Wilderness Edition here takes it up a notch with black cladding absolutely everywhere. Yep, and hexagonal fog lights, which I think are really cool. These are multi-module lights, mm -hmm. and although I suspect these are always going to stay on the Forester Wilderness and the other Wilderness trims, I would really love to see these in other Subaru models because it is a pretty distinctive look. Now, what do you think about the design in general? I think it mixes the right amount of sort of uh, butch and, uh, you know, city crossover. Yeah, I think it's nice because it also, you know, with those Euro style lights, you get sort of this this feel that you have accessory lights up front here mm -hmm. that off-road people really like to add to their cars. So I think overall from the factory, this is a good look. Yep, and lots of room to modify aftermarket. Nice touch. Uh, the tow hook points are well spelled out on the front. And of course, it has tow hook recovery points, which are really important if you're going to take any vehicle, even mildly off-roading. It's always best to be able to pull the vehicle from a designated tow recovery point like that, rather than strapping her on the wheels like I have seen done so many times. One of the things I've always loved about the Forester is the boxy proportion. Even though this generation doesn't have the enormous greenhouse that we found in previous generation Foresters, it is still pretty tall inside. And you'll really notice that if for some reason you wanted to wear your chainsaw helmet right here as you're driving down the road. Or if you're in construction and you have to wear a hard hat all day long, you don't have to worry about accidentally keeping it on, hopping in and bopping yourself on the head because I still have maybe about three quarters of an inch of headroom left even with this helmet on. If you plan on tracking your Subaru Forester Wilderness, this is gonna be a great fit. Let's see how you fit in here, Brian. So uh, there we go. Ooh, plenty of room right there. So you oh, got yeah. uh, you got like uh, three inches between your helmet and the top of that ceiling. So yeah, great fit. Whenever I'm trying to go off the beaten path and go camping or mountain biking, it's always nice to know that I have options up here on the roof rack. And Subaru is focused on that with the Wilderness Edition by giving you 800 pounds of max capacity up here. So specifically for if you're trying to tent, put a tent up here and camp up on the roof to you know stay away from what's ever down there. And then if the car is moving, it's about 200 pounds of capacity. Unlike the Outback Wilderness, the Forester Wilderness is offered only with a two and a half liter naturally aspirated boxer engine. It's got 182 horsepower, 176 pound feet of torque, and the transmission, though still a CVT, has eight simulated gear ratios instead of seven. The driveline changes are more than just a simulated gear, however. This has the transmission out of the bigger Subarus in the lineup that gives it a deeper final drive ratio and a more aggressive starting ratio in the transmission itself. The effective starting ratio in this transmission is 16.7 to 1 versus 13.3 to 1 in the regular Forester. And that's the big reason that fuel economy drops from 29 miles per gallon down to 26 miles per gallon if you check the wilderness box. Rounding out the mechanical changes of the Forester Wilderness is an increase in ride height up to 9.2 inches. Now that's higher than anything else you're going to find in the segment, including the Jeep Cherokee Trailhawk, which is still down at 8.7, the same as the regular Foresters. As far as front seat comfort goes, I found these seats to be pretty good, although I wish the passenger seat had a power mechanism or at least some form of lumbar adjustability. Absolutely. Now on my side, we do have a lot of adjustability, including tilting the seat bottom, which makes it easier to adjust for different heights. Mm -hmm. And overall, I think these seats are a little bit more comfortable than the last Hyundai Tucson we drove. I think they're pretty comparable, personally, for me at any rate, but I do wish this had four-way lumbar. Mm, that would be nice. A roomy cabin is certainly a reason to buy the Forester over most of the compact crossover competition. Speaking of the Tucson, this ties with the new Tucson for the most combined legroom in this segment. Now, you will notice that on the chart on the side of your screen, the Escape says it has a little bit more, but in fact, I would say it does not. Ford measures their legroom a little bit differently, and in the real world, this is certainly the roomiest, and again, tying with that Tucson. You'll really notice that if you plan on putting rear-facing child seats in your compact crossover that there's a lot more room, especially if you put taller adults up front and have those rear-facing seats behind. The rear seats do have a recline mechanism. How comfortable do you find that recline back here in this seat, Brian? I think it's 
perfectly adequate. I could go back maybe a little bit further for me. And also I think I would prefer if the sunroof was a little bit farther back coming this way and it might mm -hmm. give you even more headroom if we had that sort of concave part in here. Yep, the sunroof that you're going to see in a little bit is a little on the small side for a panoramic moonroof. It's definitely about 20% larger than the average moonroof, but it ends right about here in the cabin. And most panoramic designs end sort of right about here. Going for the briefest of spins around the interior, the majority of this is shared with the regular Forester. We have black fabric on the ceiling that supposedly will help keep you from uh, showing scuffs if you put your bicycle in the back. The sun visors don't slide, but they do have this little extension right there. And we have a pretty large moonroof, but I do have one question, Brian. Can you reach back there easily from your ideal driving position, which I would assume is a little bit more upright than it is right now, uh, and actually grab hold of that shade? It's actually confused me, I have to say, when I first hopped in this generation four Forester, uh, that it doesn't have a power shade because that is quite far back there. Let's see. Uh, uh, that, I think that is, I got it. That is quite a reach. There we go. So definitely keep that in mind if you have shorter arms. Here in the center console, we have a two screen setup that I mentioned earlier that small screen where you can get the camera view, for instance, right like that, and then the infotainment screen below. As I said before, my one complaint about that is just the size of that small LCD versus this bigger one. And because it's further away from the driver front passenger, it feels even smaller than it is. A lot of orange accents going on on the inside. I suppose we're supposed to call those gold. You'll find those on the shifter and on the steering wheel. But the bulk of this interior, again, is shared with the Forester. That's what the instrument cluster looks like over there. We have a small color LCD inside. The only major change to this interior, other than the orange accents, is this dual X mode selector knob right here, just behind the shifter with the gold accents on it. We have three modes, snow and dirt, deep snow and mud, and then we push the button for normal mode. This affects the way the traction control, the engine tuning, transmission, etc., all behaves. In deep snow and mud, it will allow a lot more wheel spin to help you get out of those situations a little bit more easily. That's the mode that I would suggest using if you're in sand as well. Over here, we have the heated seat controls, auto brake hold, and then a pretty decently sized storage compartment right there just under the armrest. There are actually three different audio systems you can get in the Forester. We do not have the package with the Harman Kardon stereo, but you can also order a dealer installed Rockford Fosgate upgraded unit. And I'm curious because that's some old school Subaru stuff right there. And if any of you have the Rockford Fosgate, I'd be curious to know, is it better than the Harman Kardon? Is it better than the base system? Let me know in the comments below, I'm very curious. Rubbery molded floor mats are nothing new, but having them right from the factory is a really nice touch in the wilderness. And that's really what the wilderness is about. There are a lot of vehicles out there that could be as off-road capable as this and are more off-road capable really, but it's the price tag of the wilderness that's very attractive. This is just over $32,000 approximately as we're driving right here. And it has a lot of nice touches like extra underbody protection, the rubber mats in the back. So that way when I have a chainsaw like this or a can of chainsaw oil in the back, I don't have to worry about that leaking into the carpet. And even the seat backs right here, even though there is not a you know, slush molded or a uh, molded rubber mat back there, we have a different texture on the back, more rubbery, more durable texture rather than carpet that also is gonna help keep them clean, make them easier to wipe out. Whether you plan on keeping chainsaws in the back or say a mountain bike or a kayak or skis or something like that, this is a very practical touch right from the factory. I guess it's time to find out what that last windstorm did to our off-road trail. Two things that I noticed back here. This is a really practical cargo hook. I was really questioning why you'd want to hook on the hatch when the hatch is up, but you can hang things like gloves right there. Now the hatch is a little bit low for people that are wearing a helmet that is uh, a little bit low there. Time to uh, get out on the trail, as they say. See you down there. As it turns out, my buddy and next door neighbor Tim did a lot of clearing work on the road. So this gave me the opportunity instead to reopen a trail that I've been meaning to reopen for a while. So I have spent the last, oh, about hour, hour and a half chainsawing away. Let's go and make sure that we don't pinstripe the wilderness. I think this section of the trail is an excellent demonstration of two things, electronic control systems in an all wheel drive vehicle like this and tires, because you can have the fanciest four wheel drive system in the world. If you don't have the right tires for the job, it's not gonna get you anywhere.
This will give us an opportunity to check out the front camera and see if it actually gives you an adequate view of the trailhead. Now let's head out to the trail. I realize there's a certain amount of farce in wearing chainsaw helmets while you're driving around, but this sort of highlights the practicality that I like in the Forester. Again, there are certainly people that wear hard hats all day long, and this is gonna be the kind of vehicle where, again, you don't have to worry about taking it off where you hop in, go out, moving around on the job site, et cetera. Or in my case, you're just, you know, hanging out from one side of the property to the other, and you don't want to throw the hat in the back. It's an easy thing. If you're the kind of person that likes to rock climb and you do wear your rock climbing helmet, mm -hmm. which you should yep. wear, uh, and you're trying to hop from different spots, this would be perfect because you don't have to take it off. Yep, bicycle and helmets, etc. all that sort of thing. Uh, or if you're, you know, live in the South and you love to have a Western hat on, you know, hey, this is easy. Absolutely. You know, there was a time where, uh, you know, I was very into line dancing. It's a blast from my past that I probably shouldn't have shared, but, uh, <laughs> You know, and uh, you know, Western hats are definitely a thing. I have way too many of them somewhere up in the attic, and uh, it was a pain in the butt because not all cars can accommodate them. And that would be one thing you'd notice over the Outback Wilderness Edition. It's gonna have a little bit less headroom than this just because of the overall wagon's shape. Indeed. So fortunately, I am lucky enough to have a next door neighbor with uh, over 100 acres of available land and they don't do too much with it. So uh, they let me film and use their property for some off-road testing, etc. So we're gonna take a wander down a mile long road and uh, talk about the forest or wilderness. Now, the first thing that uh, you commented on was no power hatch in the back. Yeah, and that's part of a package that's about $1,800 and it also mm -hmm. includes the integrated navigation and the Harman Kardon sound system. Kind of an interesting tack on there at the end if you want those two options, but you're not really in need of a power tailgate, but um, at least they offer it. I have to say, I don't really mind the lack of the power hatch because of the price tag of the Wilderness. You know, it is fairly reasonable for an all-wheel drive vehicle with all-terrain tires from the factory. Uh, if you're going to look at a Jeep Cherokee, it's going to be a lot more expensive for anything that's more off-road capable than this. There are vehicles, as we said before, that are more off-road capable, something like a Cherokee Trailhawk. Uh, I almost said Trackhawk there, but Cherokee Trailhawk. That's going to be more off-road capable than this. It has a real two-speed transfer case. It has a locking differential. Two things that I sort of wish we had on the Forester, but obviously those would have raised the price tag as well. And another thing that those offerings might have that this doesn't are powerful engines that are turbocharged or otherwise, this is still just a naturally yeah, aspirated, true. you know, two and a half liter engine, so. And you can get a V6 in that Cherokee, but right. on the other hand, it is a lot heavier. So uh, zero 060 performance is not necessarily that much better. And uh, talking a little bit out of order, we should go through the numbers. Zero to 60 happened in this model in 7.7 .7 seconds, which shocked me so much that I ended up running the test over and over and over and over again. And the slowest zero to 60 time I got was 8.0. Uh, the average was 7.6. There were a few runs that were actually a little bit faster. Uh, 7.68, I should say. So rounded it up to 7.7. Um, that is significantly faster than the last Forester that we got, which was right around 9.9. .9. That's impressive because we do have the more bulbous off-road tires on here. And so you'd think that performance might go down because of that, but turns out it didn't. The logical reason for that is that we have a much more aggressive final drive ratio in this vehicle and actually different ratios in the transmission as well. So the lowest starting ratio in this transmission effectively went from about 13 to one down to a little bit more than 16 to one. So significantly more aggressive. If you plan on going a bit further off the beaten path, you'll be happy to know this does have a front camera. Um, but what do you think about that? I think it's pretty nice. It's not on the largest screen ever. It's on their little, you know, eye level multi-information screen up here and it's very wide angle so the perspective is mm -hmm. a little interesting but it's meant that is for what i wonder it's like if it was on the bigger infotainment screen i think i would like it better up there I'm, I'm glad that it has it but it is difficult to see really things that might puncture your tire and the good thing is you can turn it on whenever you want even if you're driving down the highway at 75 miles per hour you can pop it on and see what's right in front of you in case that's important but. yep Now I expected the zero to 60 time to be a little bit faster, but that increase I think was unexpected. Now what was not unexpected was the braking distance. It does go up to 135 feet, and that's all because of the all-terrain tires that this vehicle has on it. The Yokohama Geolanders are not the most aggressive off-road tires out there, but they have a nice balance of comfort on the road mm -hmm. and capability out here on the trail. And that's really the most important thing to remember about the Subaru Forester and Subaru's off-road vehicles generally is that they're all about balance. This is the kind of vehicle that's designed to be daily driver livable and you really wouldn't want a really aggressive all-terrain tire on a daily driver because they're just going to be really noisy. And the road noise does go up a little bit in this vehicle because of the tires, about one decibel up to 73 decibels. 
So this is now one of the louder small crossovers in America, but again, I think they did a really good job with the balance. If you're the kind of person that likes to get a little bit dirty when you go off-roading or with any of the adventures you might be taking this car on, Subaru has seats that are water resistant and very easy to clean, and they kind of feel like leather, but it's almost vinyl-y too, but they're mm -hmm. very comfortable. Yeah, it's an imitation leather product, which is really easy to wipe up. It's another thing that I really like about the Subaru. As always, the most important part about trails like this is making sure that we don't pinstripe a car. I have a no pinstripe policy here. Uh, the first section of this trail is mainly downhill here with uh, a lot of brush on either side that I have recently had to remove. So Brian, make sure and take a look at that side. Uh, I can move that mirror in a way that maybe helps you out there. Is that better there? Yeah, yeah. So be real careful on the side there about, uh, about uh, pinstriping scream. Okay. Really handy touch with the wilderness trims in Subaru's lineup is we get a little bit of extra body cladding and uh, I noticed that I have a tree that I did not move out of the way so let me go ahead and move that out of the way. But you know one thing that I did find odd is that the skid plates or at least the majority of the skid plates on the wilderness trims are optional. They're dealer installed accessories. They are designed by Subaru but you have to add them on after you purchase the vehicle. Now the Forester model that we're driving today it does have the optional skid plates on it. I know some people are out there are obsessed in a negative way with the body cladding that we find on a lot of modern Subarus, but this kind of activity is really why you want the black body cladding, because it's going to show the scratches less than the paint, and it's going to be easier to replace if you want to replace it if it does get scratched up. With the black trim components, there's no need to color match because they're all the same color, so you can just peel and stick some new black body cladding bits on your car if you want to. Again, as I was saying before, we have a little bit of underbody protection standard. The rest is optional in the wilderness. And if you plan on doing this kind of activity with your Subaru, that's definitely something that I would get. Right now, I have the X-Drive in dirt mode. It's also dirt slash snow mode. And that's the most appropriate for the trails that we'll be on. And we're going to start going uphill a little bit here. This kind of terrain is honestly where tires are more important than the four-wheel drive or all-wheel drive system. On these kinds of trails, if we had regular all-season tires, we would definitely be slipping and sliding an awful lot more. All-terrain tires have a more aggressive tread, and they're better at ejecting mud. That's really important if you do find yourself on a muddier trail, because you actually don't want the mud to stay in the tire. Uh, oddly enough, with a snow tire, you want the snow to pack in those treads. That is one difference there. And again, more brush here to clear out of the way. Let's uh, resume this conversation after we move these trees. So yeah, again, tires are important as well as ground clearance. And that's why we have the increased ground clearance here in the wilderness. Now, if you are interested in a locking rear differential or a limited slip, you can find those aftermarket. And that really would increase the capability of the wilderness model. As you can see out on the trail, the front camera view does give us an expanded view of what's going on up front. It's about the same view that you'll find on the GoPro that's looking directly at the front, but the image is a little bit too small. I don't find it overly useful. Subaru does a really good job tuning their vehicles for like this kind of trail, like gravel roads, forest roads, uh, you know, uh, fire truck trails, that sort of thing. The average kind of stuff that you'll find in a national park or even some BLM properties. But if you really want to take your vehicle to the off-road park every weekend and rock climb or do half pipes, things like that, you're really going to need the next level in off-road performance. I think Subaru's done a really good job with this. And the handling on-road, although it does take a bit of a toll having these all-terrain tires on it, it still handles pretty reasonably. I agree, yeah. Obviously, the bigger tires on the Forester give you more sidewall, more cushion, mm -hmm. and on road you're going to feel that, and off the pavement you're going to feel it as well. Um, you will. This feels a little bit more like a, an older car in some ways. I mean, it's yeah, like yeah. if you prefer a slightly softer ride, something that's a bit more compliant, soaks up those potholes, washboard pavement, etc., better, you're going to want something like this. And it is definitely noticeable this versus you know your average Subaru Forester. Fuel economy is really the only thing to complain about versus the regular Forester. Forester has really great fuel economy in this segment, even though it's not a hybrid. But because they've altered the final drive ratios to give this that lower gear ratio for starting, for going up hills, etc., all the kind of situations that we've been in today, fuel economy suffers a little bit. And in real world driving, you're going to notice about a two to three mile per gallon difference, especially out on open highway, because out on the highway at 75 or 80 miles an hour, like you can do in Texas, or 70 miles an hour, like you can do in many states in the US, you're going to notice that the engine is a little bit higher so it's gonna be a little bit noisier to give you that same speed and fuel economy is gonna drop down a little bit as well at the end of the day the wilderness edition really embodies to me what Subaru is all about and you know if you want a more powerful engine with your mm -hmm. wilderness edition you can go for the Outback 
Here, I think the engine is working just fine to get us through the slow paces we need to get yeah. through the off-road sections. I wouldn't sections. mind the turbo. I turbo would say. help. The turbo would help, but... But this versus the Outback Wilderness, it's kind of an interesting twist. The Outback is a bit bigger on the outside. It's longer, I should yeah. say. It's not quite as tall. So if you're shorter and you put a lot of things on the roof, you might want the Outback over this. Obviously, if you want the turbo, you're going to want that as well. But there are going to be off-road situations where the Forester is going to be a little bit more desirable because of its size. It's exactly. a little bit smaller, a little bit easier to get in and out of places. And its approach and departure angles are a little bit more off-road ready than the Outback, just yeah, mainly, because bit, yeah. of, mainly because of the overhang and the shape of that car compared right. to this one. So how has the Outback Wilderness held up in the wilderness for a week? Now that we're back from the trail, obviously this uh, rubber mat back here is easy to clean out. And again, this is not something that is particularly unique. You could obviously get a rubber mat in anything, a RAV4 or a Cherokee or whatever. But I do like the fact that Subaru has thought about this sort of thing right from the factory. If you want to know how the rest of the Forester lineup stacks up against the competition, there is a separate video on that. Let's just talk about this wilderness. How much was this model? It was around 34165 with destination. That's not bad. And the price tag is really the important thing. This is significantly less expensive than a comparably equipped Jeep Cherokee Trailhawk. I almost said Trackhawk there again. Uh, the Trailhawk starts a little bit more than this. And if you comparably equip it like this model, it's going to be nearly $10,000 mm. more expensive. It will have a V6 and a locking differential though. And this one's actually missing that one package I mentioned earlier that has the power rear tailgate, the Harman Kardon stereo, and the built-in navigation. And to me... How much is that package? The package is $1,850. That's not a bad deal. So even at $1,850, this is still going to be significantly less than that Jeep. Mm -hmm. um, and other than that, the only other options are colors from the factory. After that, there are a ton of dealer installed options, which is an odd twist with this model. Rather than having the underbody protection plates standard from the factory, even though the all-terrain tires are standard from the factory, the underbody plates are optional and have to be installed by the dealer. What do you think of these black wheels? I'm not a fan. I think black wheels have a time and a place, and this is one of those places. Ooh, I think there's never a time or a place for a black wheel. Let us know about that in the comments section below. Another thing I could live without are black hood graphics. How do you feel about this? Jeep has been doing it, now Subaru has adopted it, and I just think they look silly. Well, you know, when we were out on the trail earlier, I didn't even really notice it. I knew they were there, but in the moment, not really that helpful in my opinion. Yeah, and all of this is still potentially glary over here, so it's not like they gave us a matte black hood. It's just sort of a stripe in the middle. Now let's take a deep dive into pricing. For 2022, the Forester Wilderness starts at $32,820. It's positioned in the middle, relatively speaking, of the Forester lineup. The base model is a great value in the compact crossover segment, starting at $25,195, and all-wheel drive is standard on that model. That's something that you generally have to pay $1,500 to $2,000 extra for in most crossovers. Because the Wilderness is in the middle, there is also a more expensive limited trim and a more expensive touring trim at the top. The pricing scheme makes sense because it puts the Forester Wilderness about $4,000 less expensive than the other Wilderness model in the lineup, the Outback Wilderness. But before we talk about that, let's dive into the competition with the Toyota RAV4 first. As you probably guessed, two big selling points of the RAV4 are reliability and dependability. But with this generation of RAV4, because sales have absolutely exploded, the RAV4 is the best selling anything that is not a pickup truck in America. Over 400,000 units a year go out the door. Toyota has been able to make a bunch of different versions of the RAV4. There's a hybrid, there's a plug-in hybrid, there are off-road focused trims. And interestingly, there are now two off-road focused trims. There's the RAV4 Adventure, and then there's the RAV4 TRD Off-Road. The interesting twist with this generation of RAV4 is that it has two different all-wheel drive systems. There's one all-wheel drive system that is pretty common in this segment. It has an open differential in the rear. And then the optional all-wheel drive system has a torque vectoring rear axle. In the more street-focused trims, that improves on-road performance. It makes it feel a little bit more lively, helps it trace the lines a little bit better. But in the off-road trims, it helps improve traction in the rear because it will act as a limited slip differential. And I was really impressed with how well that functionality works. It is very similar to the IVTM4 system that we find in the Honda Passport, Honda Pilot, etc., and just about as capable as well. Effectively, if one wheel on the back is spinning, it can just use the clutch packs to send power along to the wheel that needs the traction. 
But in doing so, it doesn't have to involve the brakes, so the brakes aren't going to overheat, and it can transfer more power to that spinning wheel. That's the big reason that you want basically a limited slip or a locking rear differential. Something that we don't find in the wilderness trims, which has always struck me a little bit odd. But if you want one, you can get one aftermarket. There are a ton of Subaru tuners out there. You can get one in your Outback Wilderness. You can get one for your Forester Wilderness also. With this generation of RAV4, the interior has definitely gotten small compared to the outgoing version and definitely smaller than the Forester Wilderness. So if you want to put larger adults or child seats in the back of your next compact crossover, you might want to consider the Forester because the RAV4, things are going to be a little bit tighter in the back. The next competitor in this segment, and really the only other competitor here, is the Jeep Cherokee. For 2022, I don't have exact pricing yet, but for 2021, the Trailhawk model was $36,785. That is definitely more expensive than the Forester Wilderness. Now, it does get a V6 engine with more power, and it has a true two-speed transfer case, technically two of them. If you want to know about that, check out the Cherokee video and a locking rear differential. So if you're looking for the next level in compact crossover off-road performance, that is certainly going to be the Cherokee. It will definitely go places that the Forester Wilderness absolutely cannot, largely because of that locking rear differential and the fact that it can permanently lock the coupling between the front axle and the rear axle. And that's something that really no other compact crossover in this segment will do. You can engage X mode in the Forester, you can hit a lock button in some of the competition, but none of those options actually engage a firm, permanent lock on those differentials like you would find in a pickup truck or a body-on-frame SUV, except for the Cherokee. This is the exception. Now, the unfortunate side is that that level of off-road hardware adds weight, and that is really the enemy of off-road performance and on-road performance. So with the Cherokee, it is certainly very, very capable, but definitely could get stuck a little bit more often here and there because of its added curb weight. It's not going to feel as enjoyable to drive out on the road and fuel economy, even with the nine speed automatic transmission is certainly going to be below where we see the Forester Wilderness. If you want that next level in off-road ability, you have to pay for it. And one of the ways you pay for it is at the gas pump. Within the Cherokee lineup, perhaps a more direct competitor would be something like the Latitude Lux. It's going to be around $33,000. That model can have the locking two-speed transfer case, which is an interesting twist. It won't have the locking rear differential, but that will get you out of many more situations than the open differential setup that we find in the Forester Wilderness. So that is a semi-step above the Forester in terms of its capability with that low range mode, which is kind of cool. Other versions of the Cherokee below the Latitude Lux trim are going to have an all-wheel drive system that in terms of performance is going to be quite similar to the Forester Wilderness, and they will be perhaps a little bit less expensive. Now, aside from those, what else could you compare the Forester Wilderness to? Well, obviously, it would be the Outback Wilderness. In this comparison, I have to admit being a little bit torn. The Outback Wilderness is more expensive, $36,995, and it may be in some situations a little bit less capable. It is a longer, larger vehicle, so the especially breakover angle is not going to be quite as advantageous as the Forester. But I suspect if I were shopping between these, I would get the Outback Wilderness, mainly for the turbo engine. The turbo engine gives you a lot more power, it is significantly peppier, and it is significantly more capable in many off-road situations as a result of that extra power. If you need to be able to power through something, you're going to be able to do it in the Outback before you could in the Forester Wilderness. Now, I have to say, if Subaru suddenly decides to put a turbocharged engine under the hood of the Forester, then I might flop back to the Forester because I like its shape, I like its dimensions, I like the slightly more upright seating position that we find in that model. Remember that the Outback, for all of the advertising, is in fact a legacy wagon. So if you prefer the more relaxed, more reclined driving position, things are more stretched out on the inside, the cargo area is a little bit longer than it is tall, then the Outback is going to be perfect for you. But if you want a more traditional, slightly boxier crossover, that's the Forester. For me at least, the thing that the Forester Wilderness does the best is to sit right in between everything. It's not the most off-road capable entry, it's not the most on-road capable entry, but it really does both very well. And that's not something that you get when you take a look at either extreme in this segment. If you're looking for something very on-road focused that's really enjoyable to drive on your favorite winding mountain road, honestly, you might as well buy a sedan. And if you're looking for some of the more off-road focused vehicles, especially if you start going beyond a Jeep Cherokee off towards a Bronco or a Jeep Wrangler, then you give up so much more in terms of creature comfort, daily driver livability, etc. The fact of the matter is, even Wrangler and Bronco shoppers spend far more time commuting on the highway than they will ever spend on an off-road course or on a sand dune. 
Let me put it this way. Something like a Wrangler is the right vehicle for you if you want your vehicle to do the rock climbing. But if you want to do the rock climbing yourself, whether that's at a rock climbing place in downtown San Francisco or whether you're scaling Half Dome, the Forester is the right vehicle to get you to the place to do the rock climbing. Let me know what you think about all that down there in the comments section below. And what would you pick if your cash were on the line in this segment? Would you get the Forester Wilderness or would you get the Outback Wilderness with the turbo? And would you be willing to pay, say, two to $3,000 more to get a Forester Wilderness with a turbo, even though that would be basically the same price as the Outback Wilderness. Let me know all that down there in the comment section below. Find me over at Facebook.com, Twitter, Instagram, all those other social places, and I'll see all of you next week.